Hi there, this is David Hillier here and I'm going to be giving a quick video on returns. Specifically, I will be comparing geometric average returns with arithmetic average returns. Now, there, there are two ways to get average returns. One looks at the return per period, the average return per period, that's the arithmetic return. And the other looks at the 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 average value created or lost over a whole period. And that and that's a geometric average return. And the geometric average return includes compounding. It incorporates the compounding effect of earning interest on interest. So let's look at the formulae for both of these uh, returns. Starting off with the geometric average return, you see that what we do is we take the return from any one period and we add 1 to it, then we multiply the 1 plus return for each of the periods for t periods, and then we take the tth root of that product, and then we subtract 1. Now the 1 plus r component, that's what you see in net present value, or any time value of money um, formulae, and that's right, because we're incorporating compounding into the geometric average return. The other method we use is the arithmetic average return or the arithmetic mean return and that one you just add up the returns in it in each period and then divide by the number of periods the arithmetic average return does not incorporate compounding and so the arithmetic average return effectively just tells you your average return made in any one year whereas the geometric average return tells you the average value created over the full period. You may think that, that there's not much difference there in terms of the two formulae, but you know that it is subtle but quite important. Now I'm going to take you through just a, a quick example. Now you can see we're looking at the CAC 40 uh, just in the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2007-2008 and you can see the, the really massive negative returns that you got in 2007 and 2008. Then you get the big positive return in 2009, but overall it's not been a good period for the French stocks. And what we do is we're, we're going to calculate the geometric average return. In this particular case, remember the first thing we do is we do 1 plus R1, so 1 plus open brackets minus 0 0.173 close brackets is equal to 0.827. Now if you take the third observation, 1 plus 0 0.428, well that's simple, it's 1 plus 0 0.428. Now you multiply each of those uh, 1 plus r's together, there's 5 of them, and uh, you by multiplying you get a value of 0.5686. Now we've got to take the tth root, and in this case t is equal to 5, because there are 5 observations, so the fifth root is uh, of 0.5686, is equal to minus, well you take one off of that fifth root, uh, is equal to minus 0 0.1068, which is minus 10.68%. So on a, on average, over the full period, you the French market lost about 10.68%. Uh, uh, so how would you calculate the arithmetic average return? Well, in this case, you're just adding each of these and then dividing by 5. Simpler, but that doesn't incorporate the impact of, um, of compounding. Now, if you look at the, the worldwide risk premiums relative to bonds, and you're looking at the average worldwide risk premium, you see that you've got the geometric mean and you've got the arithmetic mean. I've got them for all of the, the different countries. So, looking at Europe, you see that the geometric mean risk premium, so that's the return minus the risk-free rate, is equal to 3.9%. But the arithmetic mean is 5.2%. So the geometric mean has incorporated a lot more losses and the compounding effect of those losses. And that's why it's smaller compared to the arithmetic mean, where you're not including any compounding. Standard deviations, as you can see, uh, it's a measure of risk. Um, you see that the, the UK is 17% uh, standard deviation. It's one of the lowest risk markets um, uh, that was in this study. 
In terms of minimum returns, like 2008 was a dreadful year for the stock markets throughout the world, and you can see that the minimum return over 1900 to 2010 for every country apart from New Zealand was uh, in 2008. And you have a variety of different years uh, for the most positive returns uh, over the countries. So you get the main point to take out of this is that the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean, you can end up getting really quite significant differences. Uh, and it's dependent upon how many upside movements there are compared to the downside movements, because it's all about compounding. And it's also dependent upon the timing of those upside and downside movements, because remember, the compounding effect means that uh, observations near the start of the period have a bigger effect over the longer term because they're getting compounded all the time. So you can't really say one way or the other whether uh, the arithmetic mean or the geometric mean is going to be bigger. It all comes down to timing, really. So given that there are differences between the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean, um, I think it, it's important to come up with a formula that brings two of them together, that gives you a, a, an unbiased method, because clearly both methods can't be right. And uh, the method that, uh, that, that people use is Bloom's formula. Now in Bloom's formula, um, you see that what you've got is you've got weighted averages of the geometric average and the arithmetic average. So you can see here that the, the return, the average return um, is a function of the geometric average and the arithmetic average, and uh, in the in the book, um, in p page two five two, uh, I've got an example of the, uh, you know, and we, we cover this here. So let's just assume that twenty five years of annual returns, uh, you've got an av arithmetic average return of twelve percent and a geometric average return of nine percent, and then you're asked what are the one year, five year, and ten year forecasts. So in this particular case, you can see that um, you've got 25 years. N is the, the number of years, and T is the, the average return forecast over, say, one year, five year, or 10 year. Now, if you look at this, so if you've got 24, 25 years of data, in both cases, N minus 1 means you've got 24 in the denominator, and then you've just got a different weighting for the arithmetic and the, the geometric return. And looking at that, you can see that over a, an, a longer average re forecast, average return forecast, you see a, a, a move away from the arithmetic, which is dominates in small periods because the compounding effect isn't there, to moving towards the geometric mean, which starts to dominate over a longer period forecast and uh, that is uh, because of the compounding effect that clearly the geometric return incorporates compounding. So if you're forecasting over a longer period, then um, you want to include the compounding. So this is this is used for forecasts. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, in all of my time uh, involved in finance, I've never actually seen anyone use this. Now. It might be just because of my own experience. It might be because I'm in the UK. Uh, but even just in terms of all my travelling overseas, I've never seen this really used. But it's, it tends to be in all textbooks, and that's why I included it in there. So it's for forecasts only. Uh, you know, you wouldn't use it for looking backwards because you, if you're using the arithmetic or the, the geometric and you ask a question, should, you know, what is the typical amount you earn in each year, you would use the arithmetic return, average return. If you were saying, well, okay, what is the the amount you, you earned on average compounded annually, so you're really looking at value effects, then you'd use the geometric return. I would argue that for, finan for financial managers and corporations, geometric returns should be used more because it's about looking at creating value, but for managers of financial portfolios, funds, for example, where you're looking at the annual performance, then arithmetic measure should be used. So thank you for listening. And uh, I've now finished chapter nine uh, of the book and uh, we're moving on into chapter 10 now. And I've got my book here and chapter 10 is the capital asset pricing model. So thank you very much.